Good afternoon. I call this meeting of the Board of Parks and Recreation to order. I am Michelle Cummings, Steel Chair of the Board of Park, Parks and Recreation. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll move now to the appeal of decision, decisions pursuant to the provision of 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws. Please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Board of Parks and Recreation may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of certiorari. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. We'll move now to consideration of minutes. Have you all had an opportunity to read the minutes of our September meeting? Is there any discussion? I'll accept a motion for approval. Thank you so much. It's been properly moved and seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you so much. The motion passes. Are there any Metro Council referrals, um, Director Odom? None today, ma'am. Thank you so much. We're moving now to old business. 09-22-05, pursuant to the acceptance of the donation of 4.4 acre parcel of property adjacent to the Nashville Zoo for a parking garage, Parks Board Agenda, item 1221-03. Uh, December 2021, staff requests approval to amend the current lease agreement between Metro Parks and the Nashville Zoo to include the donated parcel. We'll be deferring this to our next meeting. On the consent agenda, we'll move now to the consent agenda. I will accept a motion to accept the consent agenda in its entirety. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We re received a, uh, a move and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. Thank you so much. New business, 10-22-03, the board to affirm the appointment of Ms. Christian Bugs as a member of the Parks Board. Ms. Bugs' term will expire August 31st, 2023. Director Odom, are there any other comments? No comments. I only want to welcome Ms. Bugs to the board. Welcome to the board. Welcome to the Parks Board. We're glad to have you. And I want to say uh, um, that uh, Ms. Bugs um, is our education um, representative. Y'all, I was looking for a word. I, I, was, I was looking. Is our education representative uh, replacing uh, Dr. Sharon Gentry. Thank you so much. 10-22-04 West Nashville Sports League requests a temporary waiver of the requirement in their annual permit that would allow the use of baseball fields for flag football, specifically from October 4th to October 9th, 2022. 2022. Director Odom, are there any other comments and or recommendation? Our staff recommends approval with commentary from Mr. John Holmes. Thank you. Uh, this is a one-time waiver to the clause in the permit that specifically states that only baseball can be played on the fields. Uh, we still support that clause because of the amount of activity that goes on out there. We think it uh, anything beyond that leads to too much additional activity that can potentially go on, go on out there. In this particular case, it will uh, allow the kids to finish their season this year and allow WNSL to better plan next year for the fall break. Um, I think that that was their answer this year that they didn't realize that the fall breaks were going to fall the way they did. So we support it this one time. Thank you so much, attorney. Our attorney, Alex, had a, a comment regarding this. Please go to the microphone for me. Alex, thank you so much. Hello, good afternoon. Good I just afternoon. wanted to let the board know that in section F of this, excuse me, the permit for the park use facility, F, it says the league will use the site for organized youth baseball activities and for no other purpose. 
I guess I would recommend the board, if I can do that, um, waive if you would like to waive that provision so that it, if you would like to waive that provision specifically. Okay. I just wanted to point out that it says baseball activities and for no other purposes only. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? I, I guess I'm just trying to um, understand the um, West Nashville um, whole operation because they also have use of the sports fields below the baseball fields. And is that where they're normally playing flag football, but they just are spilling over into the baseball fields? I'll answer. Oh, you want me to answer? Or do you want to answer? I'll be glad to get out of the way. Hello, Parks Board. Thank you for having me again. Please state your name. Scott Tiger from the West Nashville Sports League. Uh, yes, ma'am. Our f the uh, f this, the uh, multi-use fields that are above the baseball fields as you come in the park are where we play flag football. And uh, in the past years, we've had seven flag football fields on that, in that area. And we were reduced to having four flag football fields this, this season. And uh, that reduction of the number of fields has increased, and with the number of kids we have, um, to try to get through our season this year, we've, um, we're playing on only four fields again. Um, we're having to schedule on Saturday and Sundays to get through and to finish our season before all these fall breaks have hit. Um, we were trying to go back to playing on the baseball fields under the lights in the evenings where there's no activity out there besides baseball and the smaller two baseball fields. So we're not trying to create any more activity or confusion or traffic or whatever the issues have been. Uh, but having the four fields from seven fields has really handcuffed us this year. Um, but we've uh, come up with a solution temporarily for, well, we really don't need this waiver, but Ms. Odom asked me to be here or to, to ask for this uh, um, provision this time. But we rented some fields at the Jewish Community Center to get through our season uh, this year. Uh, but anyway, there's there's a lot of things that we could talk about later. But uh, to answer your question, yes, ma'am, uh, we play normally on the multi-use fields for for uh, flag football. And will you use tra uh, traffic control um, during these dates as as well? Uh, we don't need it. In fact, on Saturdays and Sundays now, with only four fields, we hired security to come out and move the traffic. But we haven't. We've canceled them for all the Saturdays and Sundays. We've. Uh, not needed them because the traffic has been reduced so much with just having four fields instead of the, the seven fields. But we don't really need it. Uh, I've hired comp comprehensive security. Our, our parks police were too busy to come out and help us, but we, uh, Brian Frazier gave us some, a list of companies to use, but we've had them out there, then we cancel them after an hour or two because the traffic is not so bad anymore. Hope I've answered your question. I just want to want to confirm that that this request was made and um, my my guidance was that because these this permit had been approved by the parks board to uh, ask for an exception that would have to be also um, considered and approved by the parks board. Are there any other questions regarding this? Uh, I don't have any questions, but but I would I would like to I I, I know a lot of the folks that I, I used to coach in that league, and I've, I've known Scott a long time, and um, um, I, I just think maybe another board meeting or another special meeting we need to um, I think we need to address this whole thing again, talk about it, think about it, um, about the reduction in the fields, about why you can't play on a baseball field. I'm sure there's good reasons that I can't think of off the top of my head, um, but um, I just think we need to. Maybe going into the next year, over the over the winter or something, when before we get going again, um, we need to kind of maybe revisit this whole situation that we have out there. Now that the Miracle Field is not in not in play out there, maybe there's a way that we can all accommodate. Uh, obviously, the the, the the folks that um, are concerned about the traffic and the noise and the bites and then the 
and then the kids that are up there that are playing because I think Scotty does a pretty good job and has for a long time. And I, I don't I don't see anybody else that could uh, <clears throat> probably pull that off for that many people. Um, so uh, I would just say that it sounds like he doesn't need the waiver. I'd be in favor of the waiver, uh, but he had to kind of make a, I guess a, a jag to go somewhere else. But um, I, I would like to bring it back up again, maybe in the winter when when we can all sit down and have a constructive discussion about it. Well, actually, the waiver is needed because of the language that Alex um, uh, talked about, our attorney talked about. And so this is to temporarily waive the requirement in their annual permit that would allow the use of baseball fields for flag football. And so as Alex has directed, we are waiving that wording um, as it is in Section F for the use of facilities. Um, is there any other discussion or comment? Could, could, could I add one other couple of things? Uh, our lease also says it's youth baseball. If uh, if and we, we're in violation of the of the youth baseball clause, I'll, I'll I'll be first to admit it, John, that we do have a couple of adult baseball teams playing out on the big fields. Uh, I just saw that today. It says I didn't realize it just said youth. I know I might be open a can of worms, but I'm hoping that we can at least include the adults uh, that are out there playing baseball. Um, so that's not before us today, yeah, yes, but that is something okay. for our, uh, our something staff else. Yes, I, I just I try to, to be look at. as open as I can about all of this, and I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to yes, see you. you. Uh, if there's no other discussion from the board, I'll accept a motion. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Any opposed? The motion passes. Thank you so much. Moving down now to 10-22-05, staff requests approval of the Parks Board to require 3136 Parthenon Avenue, a 0.26-acre property currently owned by the volunteer, builder, volunteer Builders to allow for a possible future expansion of the dog park and to swap 3136 Parthenon for 3140 and a portion of 3138 Parthenon to create an equally sized 0.26 acre parcel. So that's a lot going on there. We're going to defer that to acquisition. 10-22-06, staff requests approval to enter into a purchase and sale agreement with the trust for public land and ultimately to purchase 3.92 acre of property for expansion of Lachlan Springs Park. The property is located at 1900 Forest Avenue, tax parcel number 083-100-282, and described as parcel B in the attached pur purchase and sale agreement and boundary exhibit. We'll also defer that to acquisition. Moving now to 10 dash 22-07, Piedmont Natural Gas requests a dedicated temporary construction and easement and permanent utility easement for installation of a new natural gas transmission pipeline near Whites Creek Pike and Buena Vista Pike across Metro Properties. Line 431, PH2, track numbers and compensation is as follows. Track 14, parcel ID 049-000-30800 at Zero Whites Creek Pike, permanent pipeline easement, 9,400, temporary construction easement, $800, total $10,200. Track 15, parcel ID 049-0000-9400-3854, Whites Creek Pike, permanent pipeline easement, $4,200, temporary construction easement, $4,500, total $8,700. Track 16, parcel ID 049-000-30600, Zero Whites Creek Pike, permanent pipeline equipment, $4,000. Temporary construction easement, $3,400. Total, $7,400. Track 17, parcel ID 049-000-30700-3832. Whites Creek Pike, permanent pipeline easement, $4,000. Temporary construction easement, $2,700. Total, $6,700. Lastly, track 33, parcel ID 059-0000-6001 at Zero Buena Vista Pike, permanent pipeline easement, $47,500, temporary construction easement, $23,600, total uh, $71,100, to total compensation for all tracks is, uh, is this a, mm -hmm, $104,100. We're going to defer this to acquisition. Before we move to special presentations, I want to acknowledge uh, Councilman Brent Withers being here this afternoon. 
I looked at Monique, I said, I believe that's Councilman Britt Withers, and you were behind the podium, but just want to say hello. Thank you so much for being here. We're moving now to special presentations, seven minutes. Uh, Friends of Metro Parks, Disabilities, and Magic Programs to present their annual update to the board. Members of the board, I'm Mark Scruggs, the uh, chairman of the Friends of Metro Parks Disabilities Program. Um, I have with me the secretary of our group, Ms. Valerie Caldwell Buford. She's here as well. I'd like to start off first by saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to the Metropolitan Government and the uh, board for funding the expansion of this program. As you probably are aware, this program serves the needs of uh, special needs adults throughout this county, which is a very important function we submit of, of any governmental uh, body and uh, the Metro government and this board has recognized the same. Uh, along the same lines, we have formed this particular friends group and hope that we can supplement uh, the um, activities that are available to uh, these young adults. And um, as you may or may already know, may or may not know, the uh, number of persons that are going to be allowed into this program is increasing as I speak. They've uh, been able to expand the program from its original setting in the Sportsplex over to uh, Coleman Park, and then they're going to other places as well. They have funds to hire people to help out, and uh, we're making our way to decreasing the waiting list and so forth. Now, uh, the program itself uh, is a four-day program uh, operating from approximately 8, 30, 9 o'clock till 3 o'clock every um, four days a week, and they also have lots of extracurricular activities. They uh, are involved in Special Olympics and other activities uh, throughout the county throughout the year, every every um, every season of the year. Now, what we have tried to do through our program is raise funds through donations, through uh, events, and so forth, to supplement those activities by funding, uh, let's say, uh, teachers or persons who are willing to uh, uh, conduct uh, special classes like kickboxing or cooking, singing, music. They even into the various other sports, um, sailing, film, photography, just but whatever we can find that is of interest to the persons that are there. We are uh, most of these programs are fee related. In other words, if you choose to actually become involved in a particular extracurricular event, then there's a very nominal fee that is uh, um, uh, required in which. Um, um, that pays for the materials and the teacher. And if they're short on anything like, like that, then we will supplement that as well. Um, the director of that program, Mr. Glenn Atkins, has big, big dreams and hopes for this and in terms of expansion. He works, works, works constantly at this. He's the idea guy. He's the guy that gets it into place. He helps us in terms of um, uh, possible fundraising events and so forth, as well as ideas on the expansion of the program. Um, now, in all honesty, the past two years with COVID, we've been pretty much on the sidelines. Um, I've got a copy of our income and expenditures. If you're interested in seeing that, it's, um, I, I made eight copies. If you want to pass that around, may I approach? Thank you. There's not much to talk about the past couple of years because of COVID, but we're gearing up, we hope, for some big years to come. We have other ideas in terms of fundraising and in terms of um, activities. Um, I could go down the list. A lot of it has to do with athletics, but it's not just athletics itself. It has to do with um, music and the fine arts. Um, and also, believe it or not, we have involvement in uh, some outdoor activities such as sailing, kayaking, and canoeing that we're looking into for next summer. But again, these are all ideas. As I said, Glenn Atkins, he's the idea guy, and he's the one who helps organize this. So, you know, with that said, um, I'm here to try to answer any questions you might have with regard to the program. Are Thank there, you, sir. Are there specific activities that if money were no object, you're getting requests from families with children with disabilities? I wouldn't say anyone in particular. Now, obviously, um, 
Special Olympics is a separate entity of its own, and a lot of, of uh, these young adults participate in that, and we're not really directly involved in that. We're indirectly involved, so to speak, in terms of trying to help supplement entry fees and stuff like that. But nevertheless, I can't, I can't really say with certainty that there's one particular uh, activity that um, we need to focus on or we need money for or anything like that. But I can tell you this, and that is if Glenn calls me up and asks for it, we'll be back over here. So right now, I mean, all I can say is thank you because a lot of us never thought we'd see the day when we would be funded like we are. So uh, y'all deserve the credit for, mm -hmm. for making that happen. And I can tell you all the people in these programs are eternally grateful. Absolutely. You were asking the questions about Come to the podium for me. Thank you. And you I'm sorry. I'm Valerie Caldwell Buford, and you were asking if there are programs that some of the participants may cannot afford. Uh, this year, Glenn has opened up the opportunity for uh, participants to do a lot. And uh, singing, music therapy, all that is a cost to the participants. And right now, since it's just started, that's something that we didn't think about until we had our meeting, our board meeting, that there are participants that want to do things but cannot afford. For singing, it's $100. To you, our $100 might not be a lot, but to a participant that is only on Social Security supplement income, $100 a lot out of their uh, budget. So yes, there are programs that they want to do, but they're not able to do. And we keep them going because we're hoping that down the line, as Mark said, that we'll be able to assist those who cannot afford to be a part of it because they want to do things too, and we're excited about Metro Park Disability Program. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Scruggs. Thank you, Ms. Buford. We appreciate your time. We're moving now the Friends of Metro Dance to present annual update to the board. Mary, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Cynthia Balfour. <laughs> <laughs> and I am with Friends of Metro Dance, and today I just want to give you an update of what we've been doing. Friends of Metro Dance has been in existence since 1995, serving the Nashville community. Our mission is to enhance the art of dance in Metro community and enrich the programming of the Metro Parks Dance Division and encourage the growth of dancers of all ages and abilities through funding and volunteerism. Uh, Friends of Metro Dance is proud to support high quality dance education in the public sector to students and families from diverse backgrounds and regardless of their race, gender identity, body type, socioeconomic status, disability, political or religious beliefs. We are currently consist of 15 board members and those are men and women that are either family members, community members, professional dancers, administrators, any stakeholder that is willing to serve, we accept. And we have plenty of subcommittees that are standard, such as your fundraising and your legal and promotions for that. So one of the things for Friends of Mental Dance, we believe that the dance brings value to the lives of all of the citizens that participate in that, from our youngest to our adult dancers. And we focus mainly on our school age during the summer and the, during the year. And some of the things that you can get benefits from doing in dance and arts is reading and language skills, mathematics skills, thinking skills, social skills, motivation, and of course, a positive school environment. But there's also been studies that show that dance and things of the arts also increase your, your test scores too. <laughs> so um, one of the things that we did this past year is we, or in the past, we created what's called a Centennial Youth Ballet Summer Company, and that debuted in 2021, and that's where the students were able to create an original ballet and contemporary works, and they created movement games, and they toured the program throughout the community to community centers of Nashville. And so also we have um, organized the food drive this past year, to support the Nashville Food Project. And that was, um, we did that after the founder um, of Metro Parks Dance Division and the um, Centennial Youth Ballet alum, Talu Quinn, passed away. Some of the special events we do um, usually are on parks grounds. And this one, the Isadora Duncan Patara event, 
named Orpheus Reimagined was presented as part of the Conservancy, Conservancy's ECHO program. And the, in this program, they had to construct new dance and music works that were created specifically for the Parthenon because the Parthenon has a unique echo in it. So the works had to be actually set for that, that um, environment. And so the, the show, the first show sold out so quickly that they actually added a second show for that. And that show was actually rescheduled to March of 27, 2022, because of COVID. It originally was supposed to happen in 2020. So we just picked up when we could. And then we also presented a program called Pool by Pi Dance. And this was presented at the Centennial Arts Center for the 50th anniversary celebration and reflection on the build building's origins as a segregated pool. And so that performance was free and about 200 people participated and that is in, in the audience. And there's some feedback that we received from the audience that participated there. And it's just talking about how Kwame Lillard, our late Kwame Lillard, um, provided some of the information. We had some interviews of him from the past and we incorporate that with Matthew Walker Jr.'s information so that it became an integrated tool to bring the past and the present together. One of the main things we do in the summer is we have a summer intensive programs. They're usually one to two weeks long. They, they are for participants between the age of 12 and 18 years old. This year we had about 30 to 40 participants and we provide support for them financially if they need it. And some of the teaching artists that we brought in come from places in like New York, Atlanta, um, Australia, and even Romania. And so they do a wide range of ballet styles during the summer, such as classical, neoclassical, contemporary, and even character and pantomime. And at the end of the session, there's a culminating event that's within the studio for the friends and family. This art piece that you see here was designed by Tony Perrin. He is one of the teachers within the program. And he actually created this piece. And we get this piece each year for our seniors. And we present that to them at our senior awards um, at the senior spring concert, basically, for that. And also, we focus on a little bit of the health and because we want to make sure that the students have all the information they need to keep their bodies healthy and strong and full of energy. So we partner with a P3, which is Precision Physical Therapy and Pilates with Elizabeth Tilstra. And she actually comes in and provides information on nutrition and body. And she gives them information on things that need to be aware of in terms of their body, if they're stressed or if they're having injuries. We want them to have all the information that they need for that. Um, two of the pieces that we mainly support are the Mini Nutcracker and our spring performance. The Mini Nutcracker, the Friends of Metro Dance purchases costumes, supplies, set pieces, props. We hire the technical dis um, director, anything that we need to do. But the main source of this are our volunteers. Our volunteers are a strong base. And we provide um, volunteer support with sewing costumes, working backstage, baking cookies. If you want to join in, let me know. <laughs> we do um, ushering, selling tickets, everything that needs to be done for the program, the volunteers are the ones that we turn to. Uh, Friends of Metro Dance never gives up. You know, we hit COVID like everybody else, so we had to reimagine what we were doing. We couldn't do it on stage, so we actually created a mini Nutcracker film, and that was done in lieu of the actual live performance. What was great about that is that all the dancers had a mask that actually matched their costumes, and we went to various areas within Nashville to film the different scenes. Some of those places were done at the Parthenon, Fort Negley, Centennial Park, and Frankie Pierce Park. And so in order to get that out to everybody to see, we actually went to the, in, the field at Franklin Drive-In, where over 120 cars came to actually watch the film on the big screen. So that was really fun. And in 2021, we were able to go back into the Harpeth Hall Studio Theater, but we had to have a reduced audience, of course, to address the social distancing. Like I mentioned, volunteers, we've clocked over 1,000 volunteer hours just with Mini Cracker alone. We have over four, 125 volunteer slots that are filled during the week of the actual tech and the performance. And in spring concert, the same thing. We have to fill those with volunteers, and we have 45 slots for that, but it's a reduced number of, of um, 
shows. We do provide financial support to anybody that asks as we try to match whatever they request. We were actually able to meet everybody's request this year, which is great. And that tuition is used for both. I mean, the scholarship is used for both tuition and for their dance attire. And we also provide them a pair of point shoes every year because those point shoes run about $130 each and some people can go through three to five pairs. So they go through them pretty quickly. Fundraising is our normal fundraising venues or you know, membership, donations, and sponsorships. We do have a package that includes things with Metro Parks, such as the Parthenon Family Pass, and that's for four people to be able to go there. And then we do other things that are geared around the Mini Nutcracker, such as early access to Mini Nutcracker performance tickets, which is a big selling point because that those individuals can actually get their tickets before it goes on sale to the public. And as soon as that button goes open to the public, those tickets are gone. So that's a big benefit. And then we do things such as t-shirts. We have one that's called Let's Get Cracking," which is really cute. And so we sell those actually online. And we also sell the, excuse me, at the performances. So in the future, we are just planning on continue to work on our um, alignment with our strategic plan, grow our, in, our membership and fundraising efforts. We want to develop more partnerships in the community and expand our marketing performance. And we want to partner with Parks on the development of a new cultural arts building as part of the Centennial Park Master Plan. And part of that is, uh, we know we're all, everybody knows we want a building, but the bottom line to that is we also have a safety concern and safety issues at night when our students are leaving at night. And so we are dedicated to actually brainstorm um, and work with everybody to find the best solution for that safety of our students when they leave at night. And this year coming up, uh, we're going to be, we, well, we applied to go to what's called the high, National High School Dance Festival in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is at Point Park College the first week in March of 22. So Friends of Metro Dance has um, agreed to support the students at least 50% of that cost. And two of our initiatives that we're going to be working on this year as we develop um, partnerships with Afro. Africa of Nashville and Anamana Arts, excuse me. And in early 2023, Africa Nashville is going to bring four African dance and drum artists to Nashville to share the profound, profound influence of beauty and of the African art cultures on American music and dance. And Anamana Arts is creating a series of artists of residencies. Now that's going to be <coughs> at Centennial, and we're going to have them feedback labs so that they can get instant feedback on that. And so beyond that, um, it's going to be some independent dance artists in the school, in the system. So that's it. My time's up. <laughs> Ms. Balford, thank you so much. You've got a lot of exciting things happening. My uh, daughter was introduced to African dance this summer Love through it. this university and is wearing me out to figure out how to do more. <laughs> and so yes. we shall awesome. look at that with you. Awesome. We look forward to seeing her. Are there any questions from the board? Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for you. your time. You. Miss Lucy Kemp. Executive Director of the Metro Planning Department to present an update on the East Bank Development Plan. Hello. I'm Lucy Kempf, Executive Director of Metro Planning, and I want to thank this board for your service to our community. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Also acknowledge, there you are, Councilman Withers, um, who has been tireless in his public engagement support of the department around the East Bank Plan, which sits in his district as well as Councilman Parker's. Um, this is an ambitious vision for which um, parks, open space, the river, the public realm as a whole is a really critical part. And so again, I, I look forward to hearing your feedback today or later on um, in subsequent discussions because this is a long-term vision for our city. It's not something that will be implemented immediately and there'll be lots of opportunity um, to work with you. Um, I brought uh, Harriet Brooks is here to, oh, there you, everyone keeps switching seats. I'm like, hey, where are you? No, um, is, is going to give you a more formal presentation. But one note I wanted to offer just a bit of perspective for all of us who are Nashvilleians. In my role at the planning department, one of the most common things that I hear from the public 
is that it feels like over the last 10, 20 years, the way that we're managing growth feels piecemeal. And I hear from the public, we want to make sure that we're not clawing back a sidewalk or clawing back a bike lane or clawing back a greenway after development has already occurred. And it's really difficult to do that. So whatever, whether you agree or disagree with any of our recommendations, um, I'll, I hope you know that our approach to this plan has been to completely change how we manage growth in this part of our city and to ensure that we implement all of the things that are necessary to support our community, livable neighborhoods and the like, such as parks and greenways, for example, before or with development, so we're not going back and clawing it back in the future. So this is a holistic vision for the core of our city, but I would argue that ultimately it is about bringing Nashvillians together physically in a way that is um, you know, not possible with the current infrastructure that we have. And so we need to do that first before the buildings are in the ground. We've learned some valuable lessons at the department about the way the city's grown over the last 20 or so years. So with that, I'll hand it over to Harriet and we look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much again for having us today. Thank you, Lucy, and um, thank you, Parks Board, for inviting us to speak today about Imagine East Bank. I am really excited to present this plan to you today. I'm going to just briefly go over the background for the study, an overview of the plan, and then dive a little more substantively into um, the considerations we took regarding the river and East Bank parks and greenways in particular, and then also touch on implementation considerations. So just as a background, um, this is how the East Bank study came to be about. We were starting to receive um, development pressure projects coming in that were a very urban scale, urban density, and there's this realization that there's really a lack of adequate infrastructure in order to support that kind of new growth. And then there's also from the community um, and looking back from the 2010 flood, a real need for an improved relationship to the river, both in terms of resiliency and how we're dealing with flood management, but also making the river a more publicly accessible amenity for the community. A vision plan um, is something that is aspirational. It's a reflection of community priorities. It builds upon plans and policies that are already um, in place. It is based on research and analysis. Um, and then it's the foundation for um, urban design overlays or other design-based zoning tools that can be used. And it's a document that helps guide future decisions. Oh goodness, what it is not is a vision plan is not detailed engineering or design plans. It is not a rezoning, so no property on the East Bank is being rezoned as a part of this. And it's not a financing mechanism or a mechanism for operations and maintenance or um, anything like that. So we began the process um, for planning for the East Bank back in April of, of 2021, which seems uh, decades ago at this point. Um, and through that process, um, we've gone through a very robust community engagement process, hosted 20 public meetings, had online, um, virtual, and in-person meetings, technical meetings, um, a whole host of different stakeholder groups and technical groups that worked with us, um, as well as co a consultant team to help really craft uh, the vision for this. We looked at the East Bank from multiple scales, so starting way out, um, looking at the systems and the network, such as the watershed, um, transportation systems and connectivity. We dove into the neighborhood and the site scale of the East Bank itself and looked at how it's relating to downtown and to the other neighborhoods on the East Bank. And then really kind of dove in and focused on the site scale and specifically the Metro owned land. 
there are about 113 acres of the 338 acres on the east bank that are owned by Metro. So it's about a third of the um, entire study area. From that community engagement process, um, there were four themes that really stood out as community priorities. And those are the backbone or the framework for the vision document. Those are safe and simple multimodal connections, an equitable and affordable East Bank, respect for the river, and neighborhoods for Nashvillians. The study was posted on August 22nd, um, and that is a 140-page vision document. If you want to read all of the nuts and bolts of the plan, um, we also have posted online a 12-page executive summary, um, which is kind of a brief overview of the vision, as well as an interactive story map online and an, um, an online survey, which actually closed on Friday. And since August 22nd, we have been on the road. I think at this point, we've had over 35 public meetings. Um, so if you've been around town, you've probably seen us at the farmer's market, um, Cornelia Fort picking party, multiple neighborhood associations, um, and professional meetings, and all kinds of uh, meetings, just trying to really get the vision out to the public to, to spark conversation and spark feedback um, on this plan before it goes to Planning Commission this week on Thursday. So what's in the plan? Um, the plan presents two options. Vis um, option A shows the... Um, a potentially new stadium, and option B shows the stadium in its existing location. We were about halfway through the vision planning process um, when it was announced that the Titans were considering moving, and so we worked really hard to ensure that every aspect of the vision and of the plan works, no matter which location um, the stadium um, ends up um, what decision has ended up in terms of the stadium. And so you'll find in the plan that the road network, parks and greenways, the whole um, vision for the plan is not dependent upon the stadium, although it was something um, that we needed to consider, especially in terms of the road network. Equitable and affordable East Bank is the first vision section, and that's about advancing equity, resiliency, and a high quality of life for all Nashvillians. This was really a critical component in the community engagement process. People were very honed in on housing affordability and the creation of a place that's really for Nashvillians. And so um, that includes publicly accessible river, uh, multi-mobility, resiliency, um, economic opportunities, and housing. The second section is respect for the river. We'll dive more into this um, later, but this was about recentering the river as a vital community amenity and bolstering resiliency. So it's about combining the idea of placemaking with improving our resiliency um, in the face of climate change and flood water management. The third section, Safe and Simple Multimodal Connections, is about providing a really robust multimodal transportation system, focusing um, and prioritizing on transit that enables easy and equal access through the East Bank. So we talk a lot about connecting from that regional scale all the way down kind of to the site scale and neighborhood um, ways that for people to get around, prioritizing transit, incorporating a really robust bicycle network, and eliminating barriers um, to the East Bank created by um, elements such as the interstate. Last section, Neighborhoods for Nashvillians, um, to me really builds upon that equitable and affordable East Bank section, but it's about um, creating vibrant, livable, and authentic neighborhoods that pri prioritize the everyday needs of Nashvillians. And so you'll see in the document that we've outlined four, neighbor four potential neighborhoods within the East Bank um, and then outline 
potential guidelines or standards for parks in the public realm, for great streets, and building design guidelines. And that's really uh, the attempt there is to provide a framework for a future kind of um, design guidance. Lastly, the plan um, focuses in on the metro owned land, as I mentioned previously, the 113 acres, mostly within the central waterfront neighborhood, that includes um, 0.8 miles of riverfront, inclusive of Cumberland Park. So the river was really the, the kind of backbone or centering piece of designing the, the parks and public space for the East Bank. We took a river focused approach to parks and greenways planning, starting by understanding the river. So we um, worked with the Army Corps of Engineers and resiliency engineers, um, as well as civil engineers, all in an analysis to better understand the river as it exists today. And then from that, developing a re resilient riparian framework uh, that does not compromise river access. So thinking about how could the river bank itself be regraded or changed to both create floodable um, land that could also be used for recreational activities. Um, then also building on top of that, designing infrastructure that optimizes stormwater management so um, having a district stormwater infrastructure system where stormwater uh, that is captured within the central waterfront area could, be, could go into a central stormwater um, system where it's stored, slowed down, and pollutants are filtered before it goes back into the river. And then building on top of that a really um, exciting and integrated outdoor space network that links that riparian resiliency with recreation opportunities. In our first analysis of the river, there were several community concerns. The first, I would say, was environmental health and resiliency. People were worried about flood vulnerability from the 2010 flood and river pollution. And then also the sense that the rivers are really an underutilized natural resource. There's a lack of access to the river, uh, to the Cumberland from the East Bank. Most of the riverfront on the East Bank is privatized. And there's a real desire for more um, of what Cumberland Park offers in terms of um, a really great kind of park space on the river. In terms of the analysis of the riparian condition, as we mentioned, flood vulnerability, um, the riverbank itself is eroded. Um, there's outdated and in insufficient stormwater infrastructure on the East Bank as it exists today. And then all of the other um, kind of elements that you see within an, an urban river in terms of invasive species and pollution um, and those kinds of things that just show that we need to refocus our attention on it. As well, we um, were very sensitive to the current users and usage of the river. It really is a working river today um, with industrial usage and, bar and barges. There's also river entertainment and tourism. There are people who use it for kayaking, fishing and recreation and pleasure boating. And so there's this need to really kind of balance all of these needs and figure out a way to make it work for the different constituencies that need to use, utilize the river. So we worked um, with these consultants to develop a resilient riparian framework that doesn't compromise river access. And this section diagram uh, gives an idea of how that would work. But the concept is that you would lay back the river bank and a part of the east bank to provide a floodable park space, make room for the river to breathe during intense storm events, and then balance cut and fill across the site to create development that's above the floodplain. We also have been working with Metro Stormwater to design infrastructure that optimizes stormwater management. And so as I mentioned earlier, the idea here is a district stormwater infrastructure system that um, where all of the water um, works within a central system instead of the normal way where development works where every you know, individual property is responsible for their own stormwater. And this really enables us to kind of optimize the return on investment for stormwater um, infrastructure on the East Bank. 
An important component also was just realizing all of the exciting projects that are going on right now on the river and thinking about this as an integrated outdoor space network. Um, so we were also looking at um, the engagement and planning that's been going on for Wharf Park, um, the parts of the Greenway that Oracle will be building to the north and River North, the connect bike pad connection that they will be um, providing and then how that then links greenways and park networks on the west side of the river, um, linking to Shelby Park. And so how can we really kind of start to create a, a robust um, outdoor space network along the river? This plan just shows a conceptual idea of what the park could potentially be given the, these kind of backbone components of resiliency and then pl um, planning. So things like event, event plazas, places for recreation, a real focus on the river's edge, and then a living shoreline were all elements that came out of the community engagement that also kind of played into this idea. Improving river access uh, was fundamental to all of this. And that really took, um, could mean a variety of things or a variety of scales. Um, some people were very interested in um, more of a um, something more low key, such as a more naturalistic riverfront with um, docks and piers with overlooks and that sort of thing. And then all the way up to an activation of the river that could be more intensive infrastructure for boating. And those, the kind of, the, um, the real programming analysis is something that will need to be considered um, in the implementation phase. I'll touch on that in a few minutes. But just taking into consideration um, kind of all levels of what this riverfront could be, but knowing that the backbone is really about creating better access to the river, a more publicly accessible riverfront, and the integration of that um, along the west and the east bank as key considerations. And then lastly, I just want to um, touch on you know, how does this work with Cumberland Park? But there's already a great park on the East Bank. Um, and so in the community engagement, we heard from people that they really wanted to see improved and expanded access to Cumberland Park and then also programming that could that could complement the park that's already there. So the plan with the East Bank would be to kind of build upon um, what's already existing with Cumberland Park, improve the access to it so to make sure that it's open, um, you know, and, and available for, for people who are coming from the Greenway or from events or from the neighborhoods, um, and then also to, to complement the programming there. And lastly, I just wanted to talk on, um, on next steps and implementation uh, because, as I've mentioned earlier, this is a vision. This is... Um, you know, a really kind of grand vision for what the East Bank could be. There are a lot of ideas and moving components, but the critical next, uh, you know, next step is how is how does this implement it or, or how does this work? And so we have a whole chapter devoted to action items, and I just clipped here some of the ones that are related to parks and public space. Um, so in terms of next steps, you know, it will be important that we set aside the land first and foremost um, for Riverfront Park on, met on Metro property. Um, there, will, there is a need, there will be a need to do further engineering and feasibility studies on exactly how much of the, the river needs to be laid back, how much grading would need to take place. And, in order to provide the resiliency functions um, that we need. And then from that, you know, how does that work with the sort of um, park space um, that would be needed? Obviously, this would um, entail a lot of significant partnership um, with the parks department, with the parks leadership, um, in, a, in order to um, work with the community on programming and 
operations and maintenance and funding um, feasibility and all of, all of those sorts of things. So there are a lot of next steps um, and implementation steps that need to happen for this vision to turn into a reality, but we are really excited for the, the idea that's kind of come together from this planning process and um, are you know, excited to kind of see that moving to the next, next phase. So just in closing, um, again, this is the, the illustrative option of the vision plan. And the, um, the vision plan will be at Metro Nashville Planning Commission on Thursday at 3.30 um, at the school board. So um, this will be a public meeting um, with a public hearing. So people are invited to come out. And um, if you haven't, uh, written in comments or provided feedback to do so at that point. And with that, I will um, wrap up and we can take any questions. Thank you, Harriet. I appreciate your time and your Excellent. presentation. Thank you to Lucy as well. Are there any questions from the board? Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that, and, and I have a question, but thank you so much. It's really helpful to hear the vision mm -hmm. and to hear about coordinated efforts and um, thinking long-term, so I, I appreciate all of that. Um, I think I'm just trying to understand a little bit more with the park lens to understand the vision um, and how that impacts parks. Is it in, in it's, I, I think the greenways, according to the vision, would be increased, but is there, is, is park space and park acreage increased according to the vision? If you can just clarify those details. Yes, yes, that is true. Um, I'm not sure the exact acreage. I believe it's about 10 acres um, of park space that's being envisioned, but it's all kind of will be dependent on further kind of engineering and um, feasibility studies, especially related to the river, um, the river grading and layback of the river that would need to take place. And greenways, and greenways as well as correct. Right. Yes. Yes. And if I'm looking at this right, it also depends on if the Titans decide where their stadium. Absolutely, okay. yes, and that that's a big component. Mm -hmm. Looks like we lose. Sure. Please. This will take a second because it's at the beginning. Okay, sorry. I was just trying to be efficient with everyone's time. So um, if, you, if you see under option one, if the stadium remains in place, sorry, on the right, um, obviously we're committed to building on the existing Greenways vision um, that, that the department has today. Um, so under either scenario. If you move the stadium to the east under the scenario on the left, then, and that decision hasn't been made, right? So just disclaimer, there's a lot of components to the decision about the stadium. Our goal was to give some visibility about the urban design, mobility, and open space implications of either outcome. And so if you move the stadium to the east, um, we think there's a great opportunity to open up the development and the land between the river and the stadium, and that a park's um, uh, use there would be appropriate given our resiliency goals. So does that answer? Okay. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Harriet and Lucy, thank you again for your time. Um, we've been asked to make sure that we go and give input. If you have not already, please do so. And with that parks lens in mind, we are moving now to capital projects and update from Tim Nate. Hello, I'll be quick and as you, and uh, just hit the highlights as usual. Um, first in Gay Park, we've launched design on that um, and we're looking at a, probably a mid-November first round of public meetings. 
in Centennial Park, the Children's Memory Garden. Uh, we're, uh, we're working on the punch list for that right now. The ribbon cutting will be on October 18th. Um, for that site. Um, and an, another thing I'll mention in Centennial Park that isn't a capital project, but a, a, maybe a year ago, you all approved uh, a project from the um, Nashville Tree Foundation to create public art out of ash trees. And the first one of those projects has just been completed outside the entrance to the Parthenon, and it's really cool. Um, so if you have time, go out and check that out. Um, Old Hickory, we're proceeding with uh, design on the community center. We will have a, a second public meeting on November 3rd. At Severe Park, the Sunnyside Mansion restoration, construction mobilization has begun. Construction fences are up. They're installing erosion control. Um, heads up, the next round is the tree removal, which is always a, a public relations concern. concern. Uh, rest assured, we meet and uh, by far exceed all of the tree ordinance requirements on that site. Um, Tusculum, Ro Tusculum Road Park, uh, that master plan uh, process is underway and we will have public meetings on October 25th and again on November 5th. Um, and then in the Warner Parks, it's not on your list, but um, if you're out there, you might see construction just behind the Bellmead Gates. That's a great project that Friends of, of Warner is undertaking to um, create a new plaza, trailhead, water fountain, and some other improvements in that location. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Greenway's open space update, Cindy Harrison. Hello. I'm just going to run through a few highlights. The Charlotte Quarter Greenway Railway Trail Project, uh, we're still working through the final parts of the master plan. Um, we'll have that in a couple of parts towards the end of the year to release. Um, the Aubrey Mills connector will, um, we're expecting that to go to construction late um, fall or early at the first of the year. And the uh, Metro Center levy trailhead that's under reconstruction, if you buy there, you'll see that it's still fenced off and lots of work happening there. Uh, we expect that to be open in the next month or two. And um, a new, not a new greenway, but rehabilitation of a greenway downtown at um, 900 First Avenue North at the Stockyard property. There's a new development coming in there that will rebuild that greenway, widen it out, and add landscaping and lighting and some other features. Um, that will come to you all, the participation agreement for that in about a month. And um, it's going to be a, a big improvement for us down there. Uh, in a really busy area. There's also, I saw today, an, a new plan coming in on along Mill Creek Greenway for a subdivision that should include uh, an opportunity to increase that greenway with easements and, um, and new trail. And that's all, unless you have questions. Thank you, Cindy, we Thank appreciate you. it. Moving now to upcoming special activities and events, Jackie Jones. Good afternoon, everybody. October is my favorite time of month, and apparently a lot of other people too. This is one of the longest events lists that uh, we've had this year. So I'm just gonna run through this real quickly. Forgive me if I read some of these, but uh, first up is Dinner by the Bridge, which is a fundraiser for Greenways for Nashville. It begins at 6 p.m. Thursday night at Cumberland Park. Saturday, for those of you who like to play chess, is National Chess Day in Centennial Park. Uh, the event is from 9 to 6 p.m. and is designed to call attention to the game of chess, and it also serves as a fundraiser for the Nashville Chess Club. There'll be games going on all over the park. Whether you're a novice or an expert, there's a game for you. On October 15th, Nashville, the Nashville Humane Association presents Dog Days in the Park. And if you're a pet parent, you know that this is a fun event for dogs, dog parents, and their friends. They will have music, food, uh, costumes, contests, prizes, and more. Uh, the fun begins at 10 a.m. in Centennial Park. Also on October 15th, we have our second annual anti-bullying event in Hadley Park. Last year's event was the inaugural event, and it was very successful. We had more than 500 kids uh, turning out for the event. 
uh, not just to make a commitment about anti-bullying, but to learn strategies and other techniques to help them prevent bullying in their environments, whether they're uh, at school or at home or just wherever. Uh, the event, of course, is sponsored by our very own Metro Parks Community Centers. Uh, on the 16th, Jazz on the Cumberland, uh, which is a very popular event, is scheduled from 5.30 to 8 p.m. on Sunday at Cumberland Park. The event, of course, is free to the public and always a crowd pleaser, especially for those who enjoy smooth jazz. And finally, Musicians Corners Fall Market, the yearly fall celebration held in Centennial Park, will return to the Musicians Corner Amphitheater on October 22nd and the 23rd. Enjoy uh, the fall season while you shop from a broad selection of artisans and food vendors uh, and so on. Kidsville uh, will also be on site uh, for this activity and they are giving away 200 free trees uh, on Sunday in partnership with the Nashville Tree Foundation. So that concludes my report and there are more events that are listed on our website as well as on the handout you have there. That is questions? absolutely quite the list. <laughs> absolutely, any questions? Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Report of the director, Director Odom. Thank you so much. Um, as you heard from Jackie, um, Tim, and Cindy, there's quite a bit going on in the park system as usual. Um, so I only have a few things I wanted to mention to you all. Um, the 27th annual uh, Celebrate Nashville Cultural Festival was this past weekend on October 1st. It was awesome, uh, very well attended, and um, uh, made me very uh, excited and much more appreciative of uh, our city here in Nashville to see all the diversity um, and the diver diverse cultures that um, call Nashville home. Um, so I hope that you all were, were able to attend that, but if you um, were not, next year is a good time to, to try that. Um, we are, uh, as a department, continue to work to fill um, vacancies across the department. Uh, we're working both with um, external organizations as well as um, some of our peer departments, collaborating with some of our peer departments here in Metro. And um, those um, endeavors look very favorable. So hopefully um, in the next uh, couple of months, I'll be able to give you a more detailed uptale about um, positions that we have filled and or are pending. Um, I mentioned last month that we had started discussions with um, the finance department and the administration about the upcoming capital spending plan. Um, as soon as we have a, uh, a finalized roster of um, requests that will impact the parks department, I will share those with you. Right now that list is in um, development. We have submitted a preliminary list and again, most of those requests um, on those lists are um, of a deferred maintenance nature to care for the um, our aging park system. And then too, there are a few items on there to um, address uh, cost escalations of projects that are um, ongoing or in progress in the system. Um, and then finally, we received the final order from the Tennessee Historic um, Historical Commission uh, regarding the renaming of Hadley Park. The determination was that um, the renaming of the park does not, um, is not covered under the Tennessee Heritage Protection Act. So it is not, the naming is not under the authority of the Tennessee Historical Commission. So um, the Parks Board's vote to um, rename the park or, or forward the renaming of the park to the commission stands. So in essence, you have already renamed the park. So um, that stands and our next steps um, are really um, kind of behind the scenes, nuts and bolts details to see uh, what signage we need to change. As you recall in the, um, um, in the policy revision, uh, you approved that the organization that requested the name change would pay for you know, signage, et cetera, anything that we needed to be changed. And that was 
um, the minority caucus of the Metro Council. So I envision that being some kind of internal transaction, a, a, a journal entry or something like that. But um, we will work those details out and we'll follow up with you um, on concrete next steps. Um, any questions? Yeah, I'd love to get an update mm -hmm. on the um, hiring of Rick Taylor's position, the maintenance um, position. If there's an update on that, I'd love to hear it. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Um, the posting for that position, I think it was it was published either late last week or this week. It closes on um, October 13th. It is um, an open competitive position, I mean a posting, so all who are interested and qualified are encouraged to um, apply. Um, and I plan to work to, to fill um, that position quickly. So um, internal candidates and those external, um, we, we're looking forward to that. Um, as a, a, a detailed matter, probably too much information, um, in Rick's long tenure in the department, he did have uh, a leave balance and will um, uh, remain on payroll, I think, until October, uh, November or something like that. So I, in uh, being allowed to move forward with posting and hiring that, that position, I did receive approval from the finance department to move forward with that. It's called an over, overlap um, is what we call it. So I'm very much looking forward to getting that critical position filled. Uh, in the meantime, I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge our great team of maintenance staff who are already with the department, Phil Luckett, William Manuel, Jackie McKinley, Randall Lance, and others, all of those who support them, who have stepped up uh, as, in this uh, interim transition time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the board? I want to say thank you to Monique and her team uh, for, um, I know it's what you do, but for following that, um, um, our legislation to the Tennessee Human uh, Tennessee Historic Commission. Um, I've been uh, thinking about that a lot over the past year, and I want to thank this Parks Board. I know some of the seats have changed, but for that work and for uh, North Nashville Hadley Park uh, to be renamed Kwame Lillard. Hadley Lillard. I couldn't remember. Thank you. And I know that all of that will take place, but uh, so glad that that has come to um, this place at this time. Um, are there any announcements, requests for future agenda items or open items? Other? Mm -hmm. I've got one. Yes. I'm <laughs> wearing out my mic today. Um, I wanted to um, <clears throat> um, mention that there are um, events available to m Metro um, employees and board members that are called Metro Connect. And Jennifer Westerholm had, um, is the one who's um, spearheading those efforts. And I had a chance to take um, a tour last year and loved it. It was the city cemetery, and I highly recommend it. So I'm going to re-forward the email that came to um, Director Odom. I think that in my, I, in my communication with Jennifer, she said that the Parks Department attendance has been low. Um, so I'm hoping that our... Um, department has higher attendance. It was really, I think, an effective way to um, learn about the city and to connect with other uh, Metro um, people. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, we, I think um, Fort Nagley is our um, location that's on the, on the tour this year. We uh, try to participate that in, that in that annually. So thank you for the shout out and thank you for the encouragement. Any other? Okay, uh, I'll accept a motion. Accept a motion for adjournment. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Thank you. We're ended. We're adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov. <laughs>